In part one of this episode, we explored the sources, uses, and geologic history of beryllium and the Bertrandite deposit in western Utah. Now, we continue to examine the fascinating history and processes of this incredible element by telling the story of how mining operations began at the Spore Mountain Mine and how beryllium is unearthed today and refined at Brush Resources Concentration Plant near Delta, Utah. We'll also look at the health hazards of beryllium exposure in this episode of The Elements Unearthed. Have you ever wondered where the chemical elements come from, how they were discovered, and how they are mined, refined, and turned into finished products? Would you like to know where materials like glass, steel, and concrete come from? Do you need to find out how energy is produced, the environmental impacts and hazards of chemicals, or the history of chemistry? Student teams from communities around the country are interviewing scientists, engineers, and historians to answer these questions in The Elements Unearthed, Our Discovery and Usage of the Chemical Elements. This episode of The Elements Unearthed was made possible by Brush Resources, producers of beryllium products. Our subject expert is Phil Sabe, Manager of Technology and Quality at Brush Resources Concentration Plant near Delta, Utah. Beryl was reported in the rhyolite deposits in western Millard County and western Uab County as early as 1905. During World War II, there was a large amount of interest generated in the area, particularly for things like topaz, which is semi-precious gem. In the 1950s, the primary source of beryllium metal and alloys was the Brush Beryllium Company, later Brush Wellman Incorporated. Brush Beryllium was an outgrowth of Brush Laboratories, founded by Charles Brush. Charles Brush developed and marketed the arc light, which is still used in some places in Europe. From the money that uh, Dr. Brush made from his patent, he developed Brush Laboratories and developed a process for extraction of beryllium from barrel on a commercial basis. The beryllium industry in the early 50s was actually dependent on imported barrel ore from Brazil. One of the benefits and also one of the, the problems with importing barrel ore was that in order to pay for the price of importing it, it had to be fairly high grade. Uh, anything less than about 11 or 12 percent was almost cost prohibitive to import because of the transportation cost. Barrel ore does not exist in nature as a free crystal. It's usually encrusted in a pegmatite ore body and you actually have to break that material away from the barrel crystal and to get that out takes a lot of labor and so it drives up the price of barrel. The unstable supply are not favorable to the development of an industry or were not favorable in the 1950s. The development of the Utah ore body helped stabilize the price of the beryllium ore. Dr. Norm Williams, uh, he was our chief geologist for brush resources. The discovery was made while they were looking for felt for force bar. It was actually decided to check some samples that they had for other minerals, and uh, they had a very crude beryllium analyzer at the time, what we call crude by today's standards and it started ticking off counts for beryllium. The nice thing that's really simplistic with the beryllium analyzer is that the M123 source is pretty specific to beryllium and it only generates neutrons from beryllium. So if you have a 123 only source and you start getting neutrons coming through a neutron counter, you've got beryllium. As quick as Dr. Williams discovered he had Beryllium, uh, there was a land rush on the West Desert. The state claimed beryllium was going to save the Utah economy. Maxie Anderson was the president of Ranchards, and Howard Edwards was the counsel for Anaconda. At the time, they had a face-off out there. I understand they had a fisticuffs over it. And Edwards uh, ended up with a broken ribs and, and keys to Maxie Anderson's truck. Uh, they were actually in competition with brush on staking claims and development of the property. Anaconda did try underground mining. While they were out for lunch, they had a cave in. So it's fortunate that the people were out of the cave for lunch breaks. 
It had like a early version of a continuous miner, uh, caved in, they lost it. Oh. Uh, they just left it there. The ground out there is very unstable. It is not fit for underground mining. The Bertrandite ore found in the Spore Mountains is very similar to clay, which is an aluminum silicate, and looks like common dirt, except that it has a slight pinkish color. It's often found associated with floor spar or fluorite, which is calcium fluoride, and fluorite often has a deep blue to violet color. One's tempted to think that the more colorful fluorite is the mineral that we want, but it's actually the crumbly pink coating that's found on the fluorite nodules seen here. Elsewhere in the Spore Mountains, the fluorite has been mined commercially to create hydrofluoric acid or even fluoride for toothpaste. It, it, does, it looks just like the dirt, just like what's on top of it. Again, the specialized mining technique was needed, and they'll use the William Analyzer to identify the ore zone, and they do extensive drilling. Their exploration drilling is done on a 100 by 100 foot grid. We sample every two feet. They take the drill cuttings. We prepare them, we put them in the lab unit and determine where the ore is and where it is not. The Bertrandite deposits in the Spore Mountains are located in a mineralized zone of altered rhyolite tuff that overlies a bedrock of limestone. This soft and crumbly altered layer is overlaid by a tough, hard layer of unaltered rhyolite, which has about the same composition and hardness of granite. Now all of this is further overlaid by a layer of gravel, loose rock, and sand that was deposited by Lake Bonneville during the last ice age. Since the ore body is tilted, it occasionally reaches the surface, and in other places it dips so far below ground as to be unfeasible to mine. The Bertrandite locations in the Spore Mountains are shown here in purple. Several, such as the Blue Chalk and Roadside One locations, have already been mined but there's enough reserves that have been mapped out to last at least 60 more years of current production levels. Once the location of the ore body has been generally mapped out, mining engineers plan out an open pit structure that will reach the ore with the least disturbance to the overlying layers. They keep the sides of the pit terraced to safely prevent rock slides and excessive erosion. Once the plan is approved, a contractor is hired to remove the overburden usually in the winter and spring months. The loose alluvial gravel and soil is removed first and set aside for later reclamation. Then the hard rhyolite is blasted and removed. When they do their mining, they will mine down to within about six feet of the level of the ore. They go back in again and they drill on 25 foot centers and develop a mining map. For a typical ore body, between 40 and 60,000 cores are drilled and sampled every two feet. Three-dimensional structural maps are prepared to identify where various grades of ore are located. Detailed maps were originally drawn by hand. It would take them about six months to nine months to draw a map. We now have this down with computers. We can do it in about 24 to 36 hours. The ore is removed carefully. A technician with a portable field barolometer walks before the bulldozer and stakes out the locations of the ore grades that are being removed. And our people go in and with the instrument they actually tell the equipment operator, this is ore, this is waste. Take this to this pile, take this to this pile. A self-loading scraper scoops up the ore and moves it to stockpiles sorted by grade. The ore is then transported by 18-wheeler to the processing plant near Delta, Utah, about 45 miles southeast. High-grade ore is mixed with low-grade ore so that all the Bertrandite coming to the plant has about the same percentage of beryllium. The final ore has less than 0.65% beryllium oxide, or only about 4.5 pounds of finished beryllium per ton.